Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to see so many people at 9 o'clock in the morning in this theatre. Uh, an extraordinary experience for us, as this whole uh, exhibition, Secrets of the Silk Road, has proved to be. You might like to know that we've so far had 35,000 people visit uh, the exhibit that's upstairs, which is virtually what we would get in a year in one month. Uh, and it, for us, it's been an enormous uh, transformation that we, will ha we hope will lead to the remaking of our galleries and better stewarding of our own collections. But most of all, too, we hope that it will lead to more research, research of the kind that I think is going to be on show today. This uh, conference, Reconfiguring the Silk Road, really is a reprise of a, a major conference that Victor Mayer, the curator of Secrets of the Silk Road, 15 years ago held to great acclaim here in this museum and subsequently published about the Tarim Basin, its mummies, and most of all the archaeological issues arising from those wonderful discoveries by our Chinese colleagues. So 15 years on, we're very grateful to be able to have this uh, reprise, a reprise that will take us from prehistory well, well into the Middle Ages in the course of the next eight hours. Our thanks in particular to the Henry Luce Foundation for making it possible to hold today's uh, conference symposium, in particular their program officer, Helena Kalenda, who is here today and has been a great friend to this museum as it's worked on Asian archaeology. Our thanks, too, to the University of Pennsylvania Center for Ancient Studies and its director, Professor Bob Osterhout, who's also here today, who's also funded this symposium. This symposium will be videotaped, and you will be able to see it on the website, so if you miss some of the provocation during the course of the day, you will be able to catch up with it subsequently. Its organization is due in a large merit to uh, Victor Mayer himself, who will speak this morning, and to Jane Hickman, the editor of Expedition and our special programs manager. She is the, uh, the maestro uh, of all the proceedings, the various elements that go on today, and if you have any difficulties whatsoever, address yourself to her vis-a-vis -vis coffee, lunch, or the subsequent reception. We have a fairly tight schedule, but we hope to have uh, a major discussion at the end. Sadly, Philip Cole, professor of anthropology at, uh, at Wellesley, can't be here because of ill health, though he's prepared some remarks, and Dr. Chris Thornton, one of our own, so to speak, will be giving those remarks. And knowing Chris, he will also add his own views on these things, uh, since he's well-versed in that part of, of uh, Eurasia. With that, I'd like to hand the podium over to my colleague, Brian Rose, the Deputy Director, who will now chair the, the morning session. Brian. Thank you, Richard, and welcome, everyone. There will be four papers in the morning session with a break after the first two papers, and there will be time at the end of each of the papers for some questions. We have microphones set up on either side of the auditorium, and there'll be students who will take the microphone uh, to you in the audience if you have questions. We begin with Colin Renfrew, who is Disney Professor Emeritus of Archaeology and former director of the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research at the University of Cambridge. He is now senior fellow of the McDonald Institute. His first book, The Emergence of Civilization, The Cyclades and the Aegean in the Third Millennium BC, published in 1972, established Professor Renfrew as a leading scholar of Aegean prehistory. In addition to his continuing work in the Aegean, Professor Renfrew's research interests include archaeological theory and science, especially DNA and molecular genetics, and the origins of linguistic diversity. Among his many publications is Archaeology and Language, The Puzzle of the Indo-European Origins. His talk for us today is entitled, Before Silk, Unsolved Mysteries of the Silk Road. Colin. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, uh, Brian, and thank you, Richard. It's a great pleasure to be here again 
at one of these uh, controversial uh, symposia. I very much enjoyed uh, the first one which Victor organized, and I hope we're going to have some very lively um, and interesting uh, discussions today. Um, really, uh, for me, I'm talking about the period uh, before Silk, or at any rate, before the Silk Road really opened up. As I understand it, and we'll hear more about this later, the earliest finds of uh, silk uh, in the Western world are more or less Hellenistic date. So the things I'm talking about are before the Silk Road opened up for silk. And so one is talking about the even vaster issue of the early connections between East and West, between Asia, between East and Asia, between China on the one hand and the West, that is to say, the Near East, as we call it, Western Asia, uh, and Europe, on the other hand. Uh, and it turns out to be one of the liveliest themes in world archaeology today, because it's only in the past two decades uh, that it's been easy for researchers uh, from one part of the world to work in another part of the world. So it's only recently uh, that uh, the steppe lands of Russia and beyond to the east uh, and uh, the paths of the Silk Road have become open to uh, investigation um, and that uh, uh, Eastern scholars, Chinese and Uyghur and other scholars have been able to visit the Western world and study in the Western world uh, and vice versa. So uh, we're talking uh, about the vast terrain uh, which uh, is indicated uh, in that slide. Now, there are many Silk Roads, it's fair to say, um, but we are focusing on the Tarim Basin, uh, on uh, Xinjiang, the Xinjiang Autonomous Uyghur Republic, uh, or province of the People's Republic of China. Uh, and uh, so we're dealing, uh, I think, primarily uh, with this part of the Silk Road. Uh, but it's worth remembering uh, that uh, there are many Silk Roads, really, uh, and we have to bear in mind uh, the maritime route, although that no doubt opened up uh, rather late in the day, uh, and the whole range of uh, routes uh, which uh, there are between east and west. Uh, but I want to make uh, one of the keynotes of my talk today, even if it means being a little provocative, uh, that uh, I think the main Silk Road uh, is as indicated on that map, uh, and it runs uh, south there of the Caspian Sea. And it runs down uh, along the, uh, the route to places like Antioch on the Orontes, places on the um, Mediterranean coast. Uh, and uh, so uh, I shall be making the point that it is important to distinguish between the steppe lands and the Silk Road. And I think a lot of confusion has arisen in recent years by eliding the two. Both uh, are important. Now, of course, the great romance of the Silk Road uh, was uh, uh, revealed to us um, in the late 19th and the early 20th century uh, when the Taklamakan Desert was first explored uh, and then for some decades rather uh, neglected. And so this was the uh, stamping ground of Sir Oral Stein and other intrepid explorers in the early decades uh, of the 20th century, both before and after the First World War. And it was there in these uh, lost cities uh, of the desert uh, that uh, Oral Stein and his contemporaries made astonishing discoveries. And of course, one of the most interesting uh, was the documents, um, mainly Buddhist documents, of about the 8th century AD, which Oral Stein and his contemporaries um, found. Uh, and uh, he was able to get access to the great cache of documents at Dunhuang, uh, and indeed bring many of them to the Western world. Uh, a controversial issue, which I'm not proposing to go into this evening, uh, except to remind you uh, that among these documents were documents 
uh, of what we now call the Tocharian language. Um, and when this was uh, deciphered fairly uh, rapidly, uh, the, uh, the script is not a, a problem, it's an alphabetic script. But when the language was deciphered and uh, uh, translated, it turned out to be an Indo-European language. And this was uh, a very surprising discovery to find um, an Indo-European language uh, placed so far to the east uh, in uh, the Tarim Depression in the Taklamakan Desert. Uh, and it remains uh, uh, documented there and essentially nowhere else. Uh, but its relationship to the Indo-European language family uh, is well attested uh, and uh, Dr. Mallory will no doubt be talking more about that uh, this morning. Now, the preservation is extraordinary in this desert climate. Uh, and this is one of the cities there, this is Gaochang, uh, and uh, uh, there are well-preserved buildings in these totally uh, abandoned cities. When I say well-preserved, they're ruined, but there's lots of them. Uh, but it is um, in recent years uh, that uh, the uh, human remains so well preserved in the burials. Uh, they're sometimes called mummies, but they're naturally desiccated remains, uh, have been discovered um, or rediscovered because some were in fact found by Allstein and his uh, contemporaries um, by our uh, Chinese and uh, Uyghur colleagues. And so uh, I had the privilege of uh, visiting this site, Subeishi, with its uh, excavator, Liu Enguo, uh, some years ago, and uh, it's uh, outside of Tour Fan at the foot of the Flaming Mountains, and here are the Flaming Mountains. It must have been an extraordinary experience to go from Xi'an, the great uh, uh, capital of China at the period, and go west and pursue along the Silk Road down as far as, uh, uh, as the Mediterranean world. Uh, and, of course, it's hugely dry, it's less soil, so when there is rainfall, when, or t when there is water, there isn't really rainfall, but when uh, there's a water course, then you see how the less soil is cut through uh, by the river. And here is the uh, cemetery itself uh, at the time of its uh, excavation. And here is this uh, extraordinary figure, this female burial, uh, which of which a part is uh, in the exhibition uh, here. Uh, this woman with her uh, winter clothing uh, and uh, her extraordinary hat, uh, which looks like a magician's or a witch's uh, hat, this very interesting form of hat. Uh, and there is this extraordinary garment again. Now, this really is why the Silk Road is so important to us. Uh, and. I think it sometimes gives rise to misunderstandings because we find wonderfully preserved things uh, in these sites and sometimes the nearest comparanda uh, are uh, far away to the west uh, and uh, that suggests links but I think part of the reason for that is that the intermediate evidence has often been completely lost. And there is the excavator doing grow on the left of this uh, slide. Now, I think it's helpful to remind ourselves uh, of the steppe lands, and we'll see, no doubt, in the course of this conference, many uh, diagrams of the steppe lands. And the steppe lands, um, as uh, sketched there, are the yellow area on the map. Uh, but uh, uh, we see uh, Xinjiang province um, with Urumqi and so on in the area uh, there to the south. Uh, and uh, most of Xinjiang province uh, lies well to the south of the steppe lands. And this is a point I want to emphasize today because I think uh, there have been confusions. And uh, I almost gave the subtitle of my lecture, uh, One Wheel, Few Horses. Uh, but I thought that might be too provocative, so uh, I thought I would introduce that only later. Uh, but here is indeed uh, the saddle. Uh, profound in the burials at Subeshi, uh, which is indeed a horse's saddle, and as uh, the excavators indicated, uh, this is uh, what it would have uh, uh, looked like uh, uh, when uh, in use. Uh, but it is um, uh, not the case uh, that horses are particularly well 
uh, documented in this area, and they're certainly not documented significantly uh, in the uh, burials uh, before the first millennium BC, uh, and uh, uh, of course we have no finds uh, to speak of yet uh, prior to the second millennium BC. The glory, or the, yes, the, the glory of the finds uh, from Xinjiang are the wonderful textiles, mainly woolen textiles, and uh, Elizabeth Barber, who is the greatest expert, will be talking uh, about them uh, later on today. So I'm not going to try and say uh, very much about them. Um, this example is from about 1300 before the Common Era from the site of Hami Wupu, uh, and I bring it on because um, this wheel, uh, it's, there may be other discoveries of wheels but this is the only one with which I'm familiar, and I hope to be corrected and told of others uh, if they do exist. And this, of course, is a wooden wheel of the same uh, date. And I think it's worth saying that wheels were not very important in the Silk Road, and you wouldn't expect them to be. Because if you were traveling from Xi'an westwards through the Taklamakan Desert, uh, a horse and cart, or even a bullock and cart, or even a camel and cart, would not be your first requisite. Uh, because uh, traveling on the Silk Road um, before tarmac uh, was not an easy task for wheels. Uh, and so I want to make that point uh, because it may be that I will fall into disagreement with some of my colleagues who will be speaking later on this theme. Uh, and uh, I want to make the point that whereas I uh, deeply respect the work that has been done to show the early use of the wheel on the steplands, I don't think it's a very important part of the Silk Road story. Uh, and then uh, we go on to uh, this wonderful find from Ying Pan, which uh, uh, is in the uh, exhibition, uh, and this emphasizes um, the richness uh, of the textiles of the Silk Road in the early Han period. More or less, we're talking now about Hellenist Roman times. Um, and the finds, as you will have seen, are exquisite and breathtaking. Uh, and uh, there's nothing like this anywhere else in the world of this kind of preservation. Uh, when you're lucky, you find uh, textiles and silks in very early Christian contexts, which I hope we'll be hearing about later today. But this kind of preservation is totally exceptional. And so here are some of these textiles with these nice uh, putty, clearly um, some inspiration from the Western world by now. But as I say, we're talking about the, uh, uh, the period of the Han Dynasty. So uh, I want to uh, make this uh, point uh, again, uh, that I think the elision uh, between the uh, steppe lands and the Silk Road, which enters some uh, discussions, um, is uh, um, insufficiently discriminating. And I think it's very useful uh, to try and make the distinction. And the exceptional preservation in the Taklamakan Desert uh, and related areas is because of the aridity uh, of the Silk Road, uh, which made the Silk Road inappropriate uh, for a wheel transport uh, and less than ideal for pack horses either. So uh, I want to give uh, my thanks to uh, the colleagues who've uh, uh, helped me on my visit and who've indeed uh, helped me subsequently. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Xinjiang with Professor Mei Jun of the University of Science and Technology uh, and was uh, uh, much uh, assisted by the uh, excavators of some of the things that we're going to see. So uh, there is my subtitle. I've allowed it to creep in now. One wheel, few horses. And so I want to deal with these uh, topics. Uh, the earliest contacts uh, and the millet question. Uh, then the first settlers in Xinjiang, uh, very well documented, the first known settlers at present, very well documented by the wonderful uh, exhibits from Shaohe in the exhibition. Uh, and then the question of the first copper metallurgy. Uh, the question of the first chariots uh, in China, and then the first mounted warriors. And really, th this is um, uh, an important point which uh, I think has been overlooked uh, in many discussions. It really does uh, seem to be possibly the case 
uh, I'm rather persuaded, or I say possibly, so as not to appear overly contentious, uh, that uh, the first mounted warriors uh, uh, on any degree uh, made their appearance in the steppe lands uh, around about uh, a thousand uh, before the common era, or perhaps a little earlier in the heartlands of the steppes, uh, uh, 1200 uh, before the common era uh, in uh, the Andronovo culture of the uh, Eurasian steppes. Uh, and so all the talk about mounted warrior nomads spreading Indo-European languages hither and thither, uh, I think is profoundly misguided. Uh, this is a matter of controversy, and you may hear alternative views expressed in the course of the morning, which I shall suffer with the greatest uh, good, uh, uh, good humor and patience. Uh, uh, but uh, as I'll say later in my talk, uh, I think uh, there are uh, matters which are suitable grounds for controversy, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, I'll say a little about the Indo-European question. Now, the, uh, this uh, slide I owe to uh, Dr. Xinyi Liu, uh, and it uh, highlights uh, the two interesting and most striking events in East-West contacts, which we don't understand very well, the finding of broom corn millet, uh, panicum uh, miliaceum, uh, in contacts before 5000 BC, on the one hand in China, and on the other hand in uh, uh, Western Asia and in Europe. How can that be? Well, it is the case. Uh, and secondly, uh, the finding of uh, wheat, hexaploid wheat, bread wheat, uh, in Shaohe uh, and uh, other settlements, but Shaohe is the one where it's been uh, most uh, effectively uh, identified, and I think identified uh, beyond doubt, uh, and it's generally understood, and I think it must be right, uh, that uh, this wheat originates in the West. Now, uh, if we're going to talk, first of all, about the millet question, there is the map from uh, Harriet Hunt, as modified by Xinyi Liu, and this shows us uh, the finds uh, of uh, millet before um, that, that can be uh, fairly confidently assigned uh, before uh, 5,000, before common era. Uh, now, there is the possibility that millet was independently domesticated more than once. And uh, though that may seem improbable, it seems to me more likely uh, than to have uh, quite profuse contacts between East and West, along what we're calling the Silk Road, before 5,000, uh, before the Common Era. Uh, and uh, I don't have time to go through the work that's been uh, done on the millet, but uh, the DNA uh, analyses on, uh, on living, on recent millets, uh, does seem to show two main uh, gene pools, uh, if you look at the primary split, which perhaps encourages the notion of independent domestication, but a more detailed analysis, this is from the work of Harriet Hunt, shows a number uh, of uh, uh, gene pools, uh, and the matter is still uh, unclear. So uh, I just raise that as one of the first unresolved mysteries of the Silk Road. Uh, the next uh, issue uh, is the first settlers in Xinjiang province, uh, and uh, uh, the site uh, here that we see on the right with the red uh, dot uh, is uh, this wonderful site of Shaohe, which is so uh, richly documented in the, uh, in, in the exhibition. Uh, and uh, uh, the original uh, excavator uh, is with us uh, today, the person who first uh, uh, relocated the site. And it was, of course, uh, investigated uh, and published as Erdex Necropolis, um, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, and Victor Mayer has uh, uh, written a very good paper about that. Uh, but Dr. Wang Bing Hua is the person who relocated it, uh, and then uh, Dr. Idris Abdurasul uh, is the person who has 
uh, re-excavated it in recent years, and that is him uh, at the, uh, uh, the left uh, of that photograph. And so what we see uh, in the exhibition um, is largely the work of uh, uh, his excavation and his team uh, at uh, uh, Urumqi um, uh, in the Institute of Archaeology uh, of the uh, Uyghur Autonomous Republic. So here are, as you've seen also from the exhibition, the remarkable uh, indications, the astonishing uh, preservation. These posts uh, still stand when excavated, uh, still standing for all those years. I mean, it's extraordinary. For 4,000 years, these uh, timbers have stood in the desert. Uh, and um, there's uh, very good uh, uh, evidence of the artifacts the pottery is not discovered at the site, although it must have been known earlier, uh, but uh, perhaps clays were not available. Uh, but the preservation is extraordinary. Here is uh, my snapshot photo of the, uh, uh, the coffins just uh, for storage piled one on top of each other in the uh, Urumqi Institute. And here is one of the beauties. There are several beauties from the area, but uh, this is uh, uh, the beauty of uh, Shao He. Uh, and uh, a great deal has been made uh, of the uh, uh, seemingly Eurasian look. Uh, but uh, I was very impressed by some of the beauties uh, whom I met uh, and saw uh, in, uh, in Xinjiang. These are, uh, these are Uyghur-speaking uh, uh, ladies. Um, and I'm not altogether persuaded uh, that there is any uh, huge uh, difference, and I'll say a word about uh, the molecular genetic evidence uh, in a moment uh, to make uh, uh, so categorical a distinction. And there is my wife enjoying the company of these very charming young ladies. And uh, in the burials uh, at uh, Shaohe are found these wonderfully preserved baskets uh, containing cereal grain and uh, uh, this wheat mainly uh, and millet, broom corn millet, uh, and ephedra, uh, and uh, so it's a remarkable uh, excavation uh, and gives uh, a great deal of new uh, information. Uh, but uh, I should mention the, uh, the molecular uh, genetic uh, results on, on ancient DNA, uh, which have been interpreted sometimes as giving clear indication of uh, uh, influence of the population from the West, and I'm sure in a general sense that's true, but it really is not clear when that took place. It might have taken place thousands of years earlier. So I think a simplistic notion of equ equating language with culture, with genetics, uh, can be an oversimplification. And so though I, I agree with uh, scholars who suggest that uh, the uh, the Tokarian language, which is not attested till about the 8th century AD. The Tokarian language, this Indo-European language, may well uh, have come, must really have come from the West, uh, and may well have come in, in proto-Tokarian form uh, with the first population uh, or an early population of Xinjiang. Uh, that early population may have been very much earlier. And also, I'd like to make the point, which hasn't been emphasized sufficiently, that I think it's possible uh, that the approach of the arrival of proto tokharian may have been along the Silk Road. And I've been at pains to distinguish between the Silk Road and the steppe, uh, the steppe region. Uh, and uh, Tokharian may well have come along through these uh, uh, passes of the Silk Road uh, as indeed the first wheat, the first wheat we've been speaking of, and maybe even the first millet, if that really was a single domestication process, um, although if it was a single domestication process, perhaps the flow was the other way from China to the West. Uh, but uh, I think uh, we should be thinking uh, about the possibility uh, that relative languages to early Tokharian may have existed further west along the Silk Road, although without any direct evidence, that's very difficult to discuss. Wonderful preservation at Shaho. This is a felt uh, hat. It's just absolutely uh, extraordinary. Anyway, I must move on uh, and uh, say a word about the earliest metallurgy in Xinjiang, 
Um, this is a subject that's been very well treated by May Jan June, and uh, so I don't have very much to add to it. And these slides um, are ones which he kindly uh, lent to me for this uh, talk. And there you have on the right, you have the early metallurgy of, uh, uh, of the Shang dynasty of China from sites like Early To. And then uh, on the left, you have the finds which are just as early or maybe earlier uh, in uh, Xinjiang province, which has some of the earliest copper finds of China. And so it seems very possible, indeed probable, uh, that uh, the uh, technology, the copper working technology, did indeed come to China uh, either along the Silk Road or more likely along the steppe route um, and that these finds uh, which uh, uh, Mei Jianjun has uh, documented um, uh, these finds from around 1500 BC or a little earlier. Uh, this may be the still to me very surprisingly late origin of copper metallurgy in China, which so rapidly uh, became so uh, uh, influential with the development of the wonderful uh, Shang bronzes and Zhou bro bronzes uh, uh, and so on. However, this is um, a story that's been well discussed uh, by Mei Janjun and, uh, and his colleagues. So I don't have anything to add to that, except to say that I think there's still a great deal to learn about that process. And certainly these intermediate areas, including Xinjiang, are an important part of the story. Uh, the same uh, is true uh, of the first chariots uh, David Anthony will be talking to us, I hope, about those today. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the work of uh, uh, himself and, the, and his Russian colleagues has really clarified uh, the origins uh, of the chariot, which uh, is first documented uh, at uh, Sintashta around 2000 BC, uh, as he indicated in his uh, uh, article um, in Antiquity uh, many years ago. Uh, and. Uh, uh, again, I want to emphasize uh, that the uh, chariot is associated with the steppe lands, as indeed is the horse, and indeed, as we'll see in a moment, uh, are the mounted warrior horsemen. But it is impressive uh, that the chariot became so important um, in Mesopotamia, uh, and indeed, ultimately, in, in uh, Egypt, uh, and was uh, uh, a chosen um, uh, vehicle for transport in warfare, just as it became uh, in, uh, uh, in Zhou times in China. Uh, and uh, it's still uh, unclear to me uh, how the uh, chariot uh, reached China at a detailed level. Uh, I think we don't doubt uh, that these finds from uh, Sintashta uh, are uh, just about the earliest chariot finds that there are and presumably uh, the chariot reached uh, China um, along the steppe lands, uh, but uh, the chariot is not found significantly, or indeed, I think, at all uh, in Xinjiang, nor would you expect it to be in that terrain, which would not be suitable for chariots. So it must have been a, a more northern route. And though there's great scholarship on the chariots uh, of uh, the Zhou period in China, the, distinguished article by Shaughnessy and so on, uh, the question of the actual mechanism of the transmission of the chariot has, I think, not been well addressed yet, or not that I'm aware of. Uh, and here again, there's the Sintashta finds, uh, which are very clear. It's further east uh, that the picture becomes less clear until you find them, of course, um, at Anyang and so on, in the, uh, uh, the burials of the, uh, uh, the Shang and Zhou periods. But I say the mechanism of transmission is not very clear. Now to uh, my penultimate uh, point, the first mounted warriors in China. Uh, and I think it's clear that the first mounted warriors in China were around 1000 BC. Um, there is, very interestingly, new radiocarbon uh, carbon evidence from the site of Liu Shui um, in the Kunlun Mountains at the south side of uh, um, the Taklamakan Desert in Xinjiang province, um, and these uh, dates uh, seem to be earlier uh, than the dates from the so-called Scythian tombs at Arjan, uh, which are around uh, 800 uh, BC further to the north. Uh, and these are the first documented 
mounted uh, nomad warriors. Um, and uh, that is when, uh, as I understand it, the economy uh, of the steppes changed very significantly, no doubt with antecedents in the Andronovo culture, as Russian scholars have argued. Uh, but this is a, approximately 1000 BC. Uh, and uh, uh, that I, the evidence is becoming clearer and better and better documented, and indeed better and better understood. And I know uh, Michael Frachetti, who's going to be talking to us this morning, uh, has uh, views about the development of local economies and the way, if you rightly un uh, study individual areas, you begin to understand the, uh, the, the processes of transformation uh, which led to uh, these fundamental changes in the economy uh, of the steppe lands, which had their impact also uh, on the Silk Road. Uh, so there is uh, Hermann Patzinger's uh, uh, map of the Andronovo culture, and there at the right is the site of uh, Sazi in uh, Xinjiang province, and there is Major Anjun's sketches of uh, pottery of the Andronovo culture at that locality, uh, and his uh, 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 drawing of pieces of broadly Scythian character. I dislike using the word Scythian far to the east because we know something about the Scythians uh, in the Ukraine and about the language of the Scythians, um, and uh, I'm not sure that it's appropriate to use the term Scythian so far east as this, but it's similar mounted warrior nomads anyway. And there is uh, uh, one of those wonderful uh, gold uh, 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 neck rings from uh, Arjan, from the very rich burials at Arjan, which I was just mentioning, uh, and some of the horse accoutrements there. And then here's this wonderful piece of preserved uh, uh, textile from Pazirik, uh, from the burials at uh, Pazirik. Well, that leads me very rapidly uh, to my um, final point, uh, and that is uh, Indo-European origins. And now this may not be the occasion for a complete rehearsal of the Indo-European problem, though it would be a pleasure, but maybe uh, for later on in the day. But there are, uh, at the moment, I think, two uh, preferred models. One is for uh, an early origin um, in Anatolia, in Turkey, uh, around six, 7,000 before the Common Era, and that uh, is the farming language dispersal model. And the other uh, is for the Kurgan uh, mounted nomad warriors, Maria Gimbutas's theory, following that of Gordon Child and uh, predecessors, uh, centered in the Ukraine. Uh, and uh, as I've already indicated, I think this is based on a misconception. I do understand that the horse was domesticated for food feeding purposes much earlier, uh, and then you see it first used in warfare with these chariots around 2000 BC, and then the mounted wo mo nomad warriors really spring onto their horses and ga gallop off uh, making warfare uh, around 1000 BC and not much uh, earlier in in my view. So that just summarizes, there's not much more to say uh, about that. Uh, for the steppe lands, I think uh, the work of David Anthony and colleagues has uh, um, uh, indicated sites like Derevka and others in Kazakhstan, site of Botai, um, you have uh, horses being extensively used for food from 3,500 and very possibly being ridden for horse management purposes. And then I've already mentioned those other points. Now, to turn to the Indo-European family, this is a tree from Don Ringe and his colleagues, and the, the beginning above Hittite is Proto-Indo-European, and then Hittite, which of course is uh, um, one of the Indo-European languages of, of uh, what is now Turkey, of Anatolia, uh, is the earliest, and then Tokharian is the next branch, and you have to come right down to the bottom of the tree to get to Vedic and Avestan when you come to the Indo-Iranian languages, uh, of which uh, Sogdian and probably Scythian uh, are examples uh, around uh, the first millennium BC, uh, reaching as far as this area. Sogdian, as we've seen in the exhibition, uh, was spoken in the first millennium AD in this area. Uh, and so uh, I would now uh, uh, keep on changing my mind on this. I said something slightly different at the symposium uh, here a decade ago. Uh, I rather wonder if Tokharian uh, did indeed reach Xinjiang along the Silk Road, uh, maybe from, I'm not saying it was the language of the Bactrian, uh, uh, Bactria Margiana 
uh, archaeological complex, so-called BMAC, but it may have been spoken in that area, and it may well have been learnt there directly uh, from uh, Turkey, uh, which lies to the west, a point that uh, Victor Sarionidi himself has made in the past. Well, this is the rather complicated diagram um, from uh, Gray and Atkinson, but I want to uh, indicate to you uh, the, um, the uh, dates. If I press the right button here, I may... No, I was going to show you... Oh, there we are. Uh, these dates here uh, are years uh, BP before the present, uh, and the earliest division uh, between Hittite and the rest uh, uh, on their system is 6,700 um, uh, before the Common Era. Uh, and uh, then uh, you get Tocharian very soon afterwards, uh, and then it's rather later that you get the uh, relevant dates for the uh, Indo-Iranian family. Well, I can't go into that in detail now, and dates are always controversial matters among linguists, so it would be completely wrong to put the same weight uh, on calculated uh, dates, calculated by skilled linguists, uh, but whereas radiocarbon dates are not precise uh, always, but I think in a general sense they're fairly reliable. But on that system, uh, you will see uh, that the dates for the original Indo-European uh, dispersal uh, are, there is the age in millennia before the present, uh, and the, uh, the pale green shading where they happen to lie is what would be predicted on the farming language dispersal hypothesis, uh, and the pale blue shading uh, is what would be predicted on the Kurgan hypothesis. And without being unduly contentious, I would point out that they do not lie in the pale blue area. Uh, so uh, that's more, of, uh, more detail of the same, uh, really. Uh, so uh, I think this is a possible scenario for the early occupation of the Silk Road, sparse hunter-gatherer population in the 5th millennium BC. And that's what we don't really know very much about yet. And this is what we must expect our Chinese and Uyghur colleagues uh, to work on. That's what we want to know about, and the evidence must be there. Then the acquisition of millet cultivation from Gansu in the 4th millennium, uh, I imagine. Uh, and I've left open the question of whether there was really contacts uh, uh, with the West, uh, that whole millet question that I've discussed. And then around uh, uh, 3000 BC, I imagine uh, we have uh, a farming language dispersal from the West, uh, certainly documented um, at Shauha by uh, 2000 BC uh, with that hexaploid wheat, that bread wheat. Um, and as I've indicated, though it's very hypothetical, I, I imagine that there may be an association um, with proto tocharian coming in maybe from somewhere like uh, Turkmenia uh, around that time. And then uh, we have the chariots getting going uh, uh, at 1500 uh, uh, BC, but not making any great impact on the Silk Road itself. And then the mounted nomad warriors um, around 1000 BC do change the world. That was a massive change of the world. And then uh, we have later on uh, Tukharian uh, and Sogdian and so on. And then, of course, it's after that uh, that the Silk Road really opens up as a Silk Road, which we're looking forward to hearing about uh, from uh, Peter Brown Joseph Manning uh, this afternoon. And here is this famous image allegedly representing Tukharian warriors uh, of the, uh, uh, around the 8th century BC. And there is, here I take my bow uh, and thank you very much. masterful overview of the Silk Road. Could you have the microphones up, please, and the lights on? We have time for several questions. So with that, I would like to throw the floor open to the audience. I've tried to be provocative, so I hope somebody is provoked. <laughs> Hold on. Here. Sorry. 
Would you be willing to consider a sea dispersal for early millet, for example, or metal, or anything else? Um, I'd certainly be willing to uh, consider uh, such a thing, um, but uh, it's difficult if we're talking about millet, um, and we're talking about um, before uh, 5000, before the common era, 5000 BC, um, I think it's quite difficult to um, imagine communication between the Mediterranean world uh, and, the, uh, and the Far East by that date by sea. Uh, if we're talking about um, uh, copper, when we're talking copper metallurgy around 1500 uh, BC, um, I think um, it's still quite difficult. Um, I'm not sure that the distribution of early uh, copper working uh, in China is particularly uh, focused on the coast, not that it would have to be if it was a maritime distribution. Um, so uh, I would think that really uh, uh, prolonged contact by sea uh, between uh, the West and China didn't really develop until after the Silk Road had got underway. Uh, it's another question if we're talking about a southern Silk Road, a, a land Silk Road, but going down into South China uh, and then through Southeast Asia. Uh, but there isn't very much evidence for that yet. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry to be rather lengthy, I think the answer to your question is no. <laughs> Uh, if you were a stock raiser and you were living in the Tarim Basin and uh, possibly going north to uh, graze your livestock in the winter, then the remains in uh, the Tarim Basin would be only half of the uh, evidence of those people. That's uh, very right. Uh, and one thing that supports that point of view um, is the... Um, uh, the wonderful variation uh, in the clothing uh, that you find in the burials. Uh, Elizabeth Barber could speak to this much better than I, uh, but you have, uh, you see clothing that's uh, suited for uh, winter, and in some burials you see clothing that is suited for summer. And you're quite right, they must have been on the move. Uh, I haven't really seen any uh, very careful discussions of what uh, the uh, pattern of movement of one community would have been at uh, any particular time. The sort of work that uh, uh, Michael Frechetti has been uh, doing uh, in, uh, in, in Kazakhstan, uh, and he may have some ideas on that. Um, I think the, there is um, the real problem, as Victor Mayer has uh, emphasized, that the burials at Shaohe are burials, it's a cemetery, it's a concentration, uh, and their dwelling places um, have not been uh, located. Uh, this is not too surprising with what may have been a mobile community, uh, but um, it is not clear uh, that these were nomads in the sense of having significant transhumance, which I think you were perhaps uh, referring to, which may have developed later, they were mobile people, uh, but they uh, may have been partly mobile in the way that hunter-gatherers tended to be. Of course, they had their, uh, their livestock, um, including uh, some cattle, uh, but uh, I don't think in the absence of um, uh, uh, their settlement evidence, um, it's been possible to give any very deep thought as to the extent of the mobility of that community uh, on an annual basis. And that would be something would be very interesting uh, to take further. So I think your point is right, uh, but it's not really been very much addressed so far. One tiny little addition to your a um, point about the broomcorn millet suddenly turning up at two ends of Eurasia 
uh, there are some interesting things to do with weaving that suddenly turn up at both ends of Eurasia at about that same time. So there's more out there to, to answer for uh, that we haven't found. There are clear, fairly clear connections between what's happening in terms of textiles in East Asia and what's happening in terms of textiles in Western Eurasia at about 5000 BC. I too don't know how these were getting through, but what it means is we need to keep looking in the middle. What, what textiles do we have at 5000 BC? I could understand what you were saying if you were speaking around 2000 BC, but where have we got the textiles to make the comparisons at 5000 Well, we have the impressions on pottery that show that they were making, and we also have evidence apparently that they were using hemp. Um, in East Asia before they started using things like silk, that's much later. They were already making textiles, they were apparently making them out of hemp, and the impressions on the pottery suggest that they already knew the heddle. And the heddle is such a strange, conceptually difficult device that it is probable that it was only thought up once in the late Paleolithic. And about 5000 BC, you start getting this evidence welling up in East Asia, uh, and you're getting much, much more of it in Western Eurasia. We have a more, we have a lot more data in Western Eurasia, but it's very peculiar that it suddenly turns up in East Asia about 5000 BC. I think we've got to be very cautious uh, about. Um but be very cautious about uh, accepting uh, long-distance connections at a particular time period. Um, as you said, and as you know much more about it than I do, um, the uh, evidence for um, uh, textile production or weaving or sort of simple techniques of um, uh, that kind is increasingly emerging in the Upper Paleolithic period. Um, and so uh, if we see something uh, occurring at times where the preservation is not good. We don't actually have textiles to speak of uh, in the sense of we can actually feel the textiles in very many cases at so early a date. Um, so it's perfectly possible uh, that uh, some of the things we may notice here at one time and there at another time uh, do go back to the, um, uh, to the upper Paleolithic period. Uh, I'm not suggesting that about the millet, although maybe not excluded, uh, but I think um, we uh, have to be cautious um, uh, about suggesting very long distance connections at any uh, individual period, uh, particularly if it's possible they may both be uh, the product of uh, a descent, as it were, cultural descent from a much earlier time period. So I think it's a very interesting area, but I think uh, we shouldn't um, uh, reach uh, a conclusion too readily on those problems. Uh, thank you again, Colin, for that lecture. Um, first, I want to make a quick response in terms of the migratory patterns, just because it was, it was brought up, and I do have a, a question. Um, <clears throat> my best understanding, as someone who's worked in that region well, with... <clears throat> sure, is that better? Uh, my best understanding of the migratory patterns of pastoralists who live sort of around the Tarim Basin is, as Colin mentioned, um, the use of mountains rather than sort of grasslands. And so if you imagine the, the, the basin literally as a depression of pretty poor pasture land, the only territories where you're going to get any kind of pasture is actually up, not necessarily north. So you can imagine the Tarim Basin effectively ringed by mountains, and I'll say more about that later. But I think that that's an important distinction when considering that this is a, uh, a region that's very different from the open steppes of, your, of Eurasia. Um, so that, that's, that's just that point. Um, my question, in fact, comes back to what you mentioned about genetics, and I was hoping that you would say a bit more about some of the detailed evidence, um, just a few more words about what the various lines of evidence are and um, what your best understanding, I suppose, of, of how to package them in terms of some of these broader questions of East and West. I think that, as you rightly pointed out, from, from my perspective, gene genetics can be a very dangerous and exciting uh, scientific tool. 
and one that uh, oftentimes leads to fantastic um, conclusions, but ones that have to, of course, be tested. So I was wondering if you could say a few more words about that. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, your first point, um, I think, is very well taken. Um, and it perhaps gives um, a hint at the way uh, archaeology should, or archaeological research should be developing uh, in Xinjiang. Um, uh, there really ought to be uh, cave sites and shelter sites uh, to slightly higher altitude uh, where one can find uh, upper Paleolithic or maybe very uh, early Neolithic uh, traces. Um, and it doesn't all have to be in the desert sands of the basin itself. And I'm not sure that very much surface survey, that much site survey uh, of an intensive nature has been uh, carried out at those slightly higher altitudes. And I'm sure what you say is, is right, that there really ought to be um, uh, summer sites on the uplands, uh, which uh, it would be very profitable to discover. And that is maybe where to look for more traces of the Shaohe community. So I agree with that very much. Um, on the uh, molecular genetic uh, front, um, it was our closing speaker today, Chris uh, Thornton, who wrote an interesting article with Tad Shaw some years ago in the Oxford Journal of Archaeology, uh, taking, I think it's fair to say, a rather cautious view. Um, uh, I think, first of all, the molecular genetics of the uh, contemporary populations have not yet been very fully uh, explored. Um, and I think it always makes sense uh, to imagine how much uh, of what one sees uh, may be uh, a product of local continuities rather than all kinds of uh, uh, comings and goings. Uh, and as I understand it, the mitochondrial DNA data, that's the data in the female line, um, it shows very strong uh, local uh, continuities um, if we're talking about uh, the relatively few samples that have been uh, analyzed, although it's great that they have been uh, by um, uh, Chinese colleagues from the site of Shaohe and other uh, nearby sites, uh, and the, uh, uh, the female uh, lineages uh, do seem to be uh, local of East Asian types. Uh, whereas it's certainly the case uh, that the Y chromosome uh, evidence um, which indicates the male line, uh, does uh, suggest uh, some strong influences from the West. But there the problem is uh, that our knowledge about the, uh, the Y chromosome data in the West is built mainly on the understanding of recent populations, of living populations. There are rather few uh, ancient DNA analyses that have been conducted uh, in the West uh, up to now. They are come, they've been happening in the past two or three years. And the inferences uh, that one is beginning to draw from those Western uh, analyses, if we're talking about the spread of agriculture and so on uh, in Western Europe, uh, do suggest a lot of surprises. When you actually compare ancient DNA with ancient DNA, uh, it doesn't suggest that uh, the ancient DNA just an automatically the parents of the living population of today. So I think it's a field of some complexity that is of great promise, but it may be, as I already hinted, uh, that the Y chromosome features that seem to be Western features could be thousands of years earlier uh, in Xinjiang province, and we shouldn't imagine uh, people just a complete new population sweeping in uh, around 2000 BC uh, from the West. Uh, that is uh, an implication that has been suggested, uh, but the strong mitochondrial DNA lineages, some of them that have taken some time to uh, sort of uh, to, for the uh, uh, admixture of genes to work out, um, uh, I think suggests caution. And uh, I believe that the next 10 or 20 years are going to be very rewarding as we have more and more ancient DNA dates. Uh, we should remember that most of what we know about molecular genetics at present comes from the molecular genetics of living populations, which are much easier to work with. But I hope Chris himself will say something about that in his concluding remarks.